What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the J Area Podcast. My name is Jose, and on this week's episode, you know, I'm going to be covering mostly that of the NBA All Star Weekend. Uh, me, as a basketball fan, I grew up really idolizing like the Steve Nash Phoenix Suns um, era of basketball. It's what got me into the sport, and to this day, I still look, you know, fondly on that team. Um, so it's always a fun time, an enjoyable time to be covering, you know, the All Star Weekend and seeing. You know, all the marquee stars and, and the faces of the league, as well as having the opportunity to to watch the up-and-comers who will represent the league for years to come. And personally, this year's All-Star Weekend you know, was very interesting uh, for two reasons. And I'll get to the second reason soon, but um, first, I felt like it was a, a lot of the changing of the guard. You know, we, we were able to see a lot of the younger stars in the NBA be highlighted um, a lot of first-time All-Star selections this year, and really, I feel like a lot of injuries had taken place that had um, prevented some of the, you know, faces of the league to participate in the All-Star game itself. And, and I'll dive more into that in a bit. But um, quickly, just to to begin, there was Friday's festivities with the Rising Stars Challenge. We had four teams running a you know mini tournament. It was Team Joakim Noah. And Team Darren Williams, Team Jason Terry, and the eventual winners, Team Paul Gasol. Uh, the first game saw Team Paul Gasol defeat Team Darren Williams 40-25. to The second game would be uh, Team Joe Kim Noah versus Team Jason with uh, Team Noah uh, winning. And in the final, Team Gasol defeats Team Joe Kim Noah 25-20. All three games ending in a game-winning three-point shot, um, which was very exciting. You always want to see a walk-off. Um, score for a victory always a good time uh, some highlights of it of course of the uh, MVP for the Rising Stars Challenge was Jose Alvarado of the New Orleans Pelicans who's really elevated himself into a star of his own not only on the New Orleans market but just in the NBA as well uh, known for his uh, steals Grand Theft Alvarado he's certainly someone I enjoy watching certainly because of uh, his Hispanic heritage and it's always nice to see you know a form of representation of the Hispanics he did win the uh, MVP honors for the Rising Stars Challenge, but other notable stars, uh, Josh Giddy had a great showing, Scoot Henderson, uh, Mac McClung, who I know we will get to in a bit, and uh, even Quentin Grimes, who had a little bit of a, a shooting streak uh, where he could not miss in the uh, in the second game, the final game. Uh, the winning team, of course, consisted of Jose Alvarado from the New Orleans Pelicans, Paolo Bancaro from the Orlando Magic, we have Scotty Barnes from the Raptors, Jaden Ivey from the Pistons, uh, Matherin from the Pacers, Keegan Murray from the Kings, and Nemberhard from the Pacers. A, a group of solid stars, and as, as I mentioned in last week's episode, it was an opportunity to see the stars of tomorrow today and wish all of them the best of luck in their, in their careers, and who knows how many of these guys will end up being all-stars in the future. But moving to uh, Saturday's festivities, which is always a highlight for me. I know some folks love watching the game itself, but I've always enjoyed Saturday's competitions. And uh, the first competition was the Skills Challenge, which in recent years has been revamped to uh, a team-oriented uh, competition, especially given that they'll take the the host city's team, they will take the rookies, and the Antetokounmpo brothers representing their own team. However, this year, due to injury, Giannis Antetokounmpo did not participate. He would have Drew Holiday fill in. Um, of course, along with Drew Holiday, there's Theanis and Alex Antetokounmpo. They would take on the Utah Jazz's Jordan Clarkson, Colin Sexton, and Walker, Walker Kessler. And, and finally, the rookies consisted of Banchero, Ivy, and Jabari Smith Jr. Again, nine solid selections for this competition. But uh, I will have to say, I think it was, I wouldn't say underwhelming, but when you compare it to the legitimacy and the, and just the overall impact that the three-point contest and the dunk contest carries, uh, especially for NBA fans, I feel like this is definitely the, the last on the list, which is why they always have it as the opener. Uh, the Utah Jazz would actually win this competition for the host city, so good for the Utah Jazz. Um, but now getting into the three-point contest, which I, you know, for some time, I you know I want to say for the last five years, um, certainly following the 2016 dunk contest when it was Aaron Gordon and um, and Zach Levine, uh, post their showdown, the three point contest really has elevated itself as like the main event, and its combatants this year included uh, Julius Randle 
from the New York Knicks, who was actually a replacement, injury replacement for Afreen Simmons of the Blazers. We have Kevin Herter, Tyler Hero, Jason Tatum, Lori Markinen, Tyrese Halliburton, Buddy Heald, and Dame Lillard. And going into this competition, I was watching it with my dad. And the very first thing I said was, hey, this is Dame Lillard's to lose because he's clearly the best. He's the best player and he's also the best shooter on that, you know, on that list. And he certainly didn't disappoint. He, along with Buddy Heald and Tyrese Halliburton, would actually make the final with Damian Lillard actually winning the three point contest. His first win in three tries because he has previously been in the competition in 2014. 2019 and now winning it in 2023 2023 excuse me um Damian Lillard one of the best shooters in the game I've always said if it wasn't for Stephen Curry I think Damian Lillard would certainly be at the top of everybody's list um he's an athlete that I certainly don't get tired of watching he's one of my favorite players in the game that is not obviously associated with the with the Warriors because I'm biased I'm a fan of the Warriors um Damian Lillard also a Bay Area kid so it's always cool to see how far you know the Bay Area roots kind of reach out. Gary Payne is another one that comes to mind immediately. But um, yeah, no, Damian Lillard wins the three-point contest in an exciting three-point contest. But the, but really, you know, what we're all here to talk about is the dunk contest. And going into it, it was a lot of uh, uncertainty, with um, especially with these young guys, because for the casual NBA fan, they might not recognize any of them. But um, Kenya Martin Jr., Jericho Sims. Trey Murphy the third and Mac McClung, and let me tell you, this kid Mac McClung is something else. You know, coming off of a ten-day contract with the Philadelphia with the Philadelphia Seventy Sixers, known for his time in the G League, and and only playing four NBA games to date, Mac McClung came out and nearly had a perfect night. You know, and when I say nearly, he made every dunk on his first attempt, which is always it's always impressive because you're, the spotlight's on you, the pressure, and for him to hit every single dunk on his first attempt, it's like Shaq says, I can't give you a 10 unless if you hit it on your first try because if it takes you multiple tries, I feel like that's only deducting more points from it. Uh, the reason I say nearly perfect is because Lisa Leslie on his second dunk of the night gave him a 49 out of 50, which I thought was crazy. He should have ended the night with 50s all around and, uh, and Trey Murphy you know did his best and I think he was one of the more consistent uh, dunkers in that competition but it's just the athleticism and the creativity that Mac McClung was able to bring to the contest was unmatched you know I think Mac McClung was clearly the winner um, shout out to Kenyon Martin Sr. by the way for helping out his son uh, Ken Martin Jr. but yeah without a doubt Mac McClung the athleticism the the creativity was just on point with him. I'm so happy for him because again, it was almost a career. I wouldn't say career defining moment, but it's certainly one of those moments where it elevates you to another level. You know, now, you know, as I was telling my family, he, he maybe he's gonna expect some uh, some sponsorships, some deals because of just because of the moment. You know, people are gonna want to capitalize on that, and people are gonna want to share that, and people are gonna want to relive it. I know I saw somewhere. That it got like 500 million views in the first 24 hours, you know, just because it was it was spectacular. It's, it's, and they said that he's you know brought back the dunk contest, which I feel like is a phrase and a promotional tactic that they have used um, in the last decade a few times. But certainly for the time being, Mac McClung has definitely done that, and they you know they've already introduced the idea of him returning for next year's Mac, uh, for next year's uh, dunk contest which i think he should um i'm a firm believer that if you win the contest you should you should be able to defend that that championship that trophy in the following year but um he's already said you know if if you'll have me i'll do it again and i certainly can't see a scenario where they don't include him in next year's all-star weekend a dunk contest, which will take place in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, again, and and just briefly, the dunk contest, the dunk contest means so much. I think to this week, and it's it's the heavy hitter. It's the main event. We've had so many great, spectacular moments in the past. Uh, one of the earliest memories I have was the Dwight Howard uh, Superman dunk. Of course, there was Blake Griffin jumping over, you know, the Kia. Um, you have Nate Robinson and his antics as Kryptonite. 
I, I've, I've already mentioned Zach Levine and, and Aaron Gordon, which I think personally is probably the best dunk contest we have seen in the last, what, 15 years maybe. And if you want to go even before that, you know, Vince Carter, Jason Richardson. Uh, before that, you could say um, Kobe Bryant in his, in his uh, rookie, rookie showing. Um, and then there's Dr. J, but everyone knows it, Michael Jordan. And Dominique Wilkins, you know that showdown, and I like how uh, you know Dominique was a was a judge for this year's dunk contest, and they introduced him as the only man to defeat dunk uh, to defeat Michael Jordan in a dunk contest, which is which is a pretty interesting and also just what a cool accomplishment to have to your resume that you could say like I'm the only guy to beat Michael Jordan um, in in a dunk contest, Air Jordan. Um, now as for the game. The game itself, I was very, I was very, you know, hyped for this year's All Star Game as I always am. But looking at the field, you know, there was a lot of injuries that had had came into the into the game itself. With guys like uh, Stephen Curry, Kevin Durant, Zion Williamson, all those guys were hurt. Giannis, we knew, was a little banged up. That's why he didn't participate in the skills challenge. Um, he did participate, like what, thirty seconds in the actual game, just to you know be a part of it. Um, and then LeBron would actually suffer an injury in the first half and, and only played 13 minutes of the game, would not show up for the second half. And I can't blame him. It's the all-star game. It's an exhibition. There's no real point in playing and, and, and risking injury, further injury, that would hamper him from the uh, from the regular season. Um, but going back to Curry, KD, and Zion, they would all miss their starting positions and would have to be replaced by John Morant, Joel Embiid, and, and the hometown hero, uh, Lori Markinen. Uh, your head coaches were Michael Malone from the Denver Nuggets, uh, representing Team LeBron, and Team Giannis Antetokounmpo had Joe Mazzulla from the Boston Celtics. And one thing that I thought was interesting um, was during the introductions and, and preparing for, for this week's episode, Kyrie and Kevin Durant were selected as members of the Brooklyn Nets. And as of you know the game itself, they were introduced as members of the Phoenix Suns, meaning that of the 10 starters, what is that, seven of them were from the West, technically. So I don't know, I don't think that's ever been done in terms of the starters, where, you know, a, a, a star was selected on the starter for the All-Star team and was on the opposing, you know, team, technically, so to speak, with the West and East. Uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo in his seventh All-Star game, uh, Kyrie in eighth, Damar and Embiid in their sixth. And then you look at LeBron James, who was selected to his 19th All-Star game overall, now tying another record with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and I anticipate he's going to break it next year. There's just no way they don't have him in the All-Star game um, next year. As long as he keeps playing, and as long as he keeps playing at a somewhat decent level, I'm not saying he has to play like an MVP, but just a productive level, He's going to continue to break these records. He's going to continue to etch his name in the long lineage of history in the NBA. And after, you know, becoming the all-time leading scorer in the NBA history, I think we now have to start giving more validity to the argument that LeBron James could become the greatest of all time. And I know the one knock against him is the championships, and Jordan has six, he has four. Um, he's lost what was six times in the finals and Jordan has never lost in the finals. But if that was the case, it's like, I don't know. If you look at rings, you would have to say Bill Russell or you'd have to say even a Robert Ory, but we don't. And if you look at losses, is Jerry West as great as we think he is? I think he is, but I mean, he has what, six, seven losses in the finals. LeBron James, in terms of the longevity, in terms of the efficiency, and what he's been able to produce, his productivity, is unlike anyone I think we, we could have seen. And especially given the narrative of he was the chosen one coming out of, out of high school. And being given this level of anticipation, this level of expectation, and certainly being able to live up to it because not anybody could have done what he done. He could have easily had been one of the biggest busts in NBA history. 
but he was able to not only live up to the expectation, but I certainly believe surpass it. Because for many years, for many years, he's been deemed the number two guy right behind Jordan. But I'll go on the record, and I've had this conversation with my dad. If he wins a fifth NBA championship and an NBA Finals MVP to match, I might be comfortable in saying that he's the greatest of all time. And I think that's a conversation that many people might not be happy to have. But you look at the NFL, and I know they're two different sports, but sports you know, are sports nonetheless. And if we're getting ready to say that Tom Brady is the GOAT, he, he's lost in the Super Bowl. He's not undefeated. So why should we have, why should we hold that against LeBron? And the older I get and the more I see LeBron play and realize that his time is now coming to an end. And I'm not saying, you know, he's washed or anything. He's still going at a high level. But you can't deny that he now has less, le- less years ahead of him than he does behind him. Uh, once LeBron James retires, there's going to be a huge void that's going to be, you know, needed to be filled. Whether it's from a guy like Giannis Antetokounmpo, whether it's a guy like uh, Zion Williamson or a, a Jason Tatum or a Luka Doncic, it's going to be a struggle to find that next face of the league. And I certainly think we're in a spot right now where it's going to be done by committee. You know, we're going to have multiple stars that are going to be able to kind of fill in that spot. It's not going to be one guy. It's going to be a group of guys, a group of core guys, um, where they're going to be able to do, whether it's the media appearances or the championship accolades or be the ambassador for the league. Um, It's certainly not going to be an easy transition, but it's what the league has to prepare for now. And... Again, just wanted to give a moment to give LeBron his flowers just because I know there's so much negativity on the internet of people, you know, picking sides between him and Jordan. And I say, why why do we have to argue about greatness? Why can't we just appreciate greatness for what it is? And if you want to compare the two, that's fine. You know, you're entitled to your opinion just as I am to mine, but I'm not going to be spewing vitriol and, and venom versus one or the other just to put one higher than the other. Um... But I do think it's a conversation that needs to be had pretty soon that LeBron James, and it's already being had, but I really think that there's more credence and there's more, you know, credibility thrown at it now with all the accomplishments that he's being able to amass. Uh, but going back to the All-Star game itself, I know we mentioned there was a, a, a few guys who were in their first All-Star game. Uh, those individuals included De'Aaron Fox, uh, Anthony Edwards, Laurie Markkinen, Jaron Jackson Jr., Tyrese Halliburton, and Shea Gilgis-Alexander. All young guys, all future stars or current stars in the league as of right now. So just looking at the game and then looking at the the stars that were a part of it, the league is in good hands. And I think that's so, that's great to see. You know, when you're able to see a, a generation of talent that is now kind of on the way out and we see the next the next wave of stars and the success that they've already been able to amass the productivity the efficiency all the words i've used in the past the league is in good hands Uh, looking at the game itself as i mentioned lebron james only played 13 minutes he was scored 13 points but on his team guys like joel Embiid gave 32 points kyrie with 32 points of his own luca four points which is pretty interesting i thought he was going to have more of a scoring night just because of the all-star game and the lack of defense four points for Luka Doncic and coming off the bench um Jalen Brown 35 points and Halliburton for 18 points but the real story here is with team Giannis because for the first time since the new format of the you know team captain choosing their teams uh, LeBron James was 5-0 and and this is the first first time that his team would actually suffer a loss so he's currently 5-1 and in this all-star game format with team Giannis earning the victory um, Donovan Mitchell, 46 points, or excuse me, 40 points, and really had a stretch in that game while he was mic'd up with TNT where he just couldn't miss. And Donovan Mitchell, man, scored 71 points earlier this year. And, and to put on the clinic that he did uh, was certainly spectacular. But there was one guy who outplayed him, and we'll get to him in a moment. John Morant was another guy, was another guy like Luka Doncic, who I thought was gonna have more points because of the whole format of the no, lack of defense and, and and dunks, and if you will, 
Uh, six points for him. Laurie Markin, the hometown hero, 13 points. Pascal Siakam with 12. Dame Lillard with 26 off the bench. But the All-Star MVP went to Jason Tatum, who scored a new All-Star game record for points, 55. A double nickel in the game, certainly earning the MVP award. And actually broke a record himself in the third quarter by scoring 27 points, which is the most points scored in an All-Star game quarter uh, to this date. So Jason Tatum, again, really stole the show. And there was a nice little exchange between him and Jalen Brown towards the end of the third quarter where, you know, one would shoot a three on the other and then they would trade another shot at the end of the court. And and just seeing the defense that they were playing on one another and really going at each other because not having that opportunity as teammates, I'm sure they've had moments like that in practice. But to do it on this stage in front of the audience, in front of a, you know, a national audience as well on television, um, certainly something fun to see and it, and it goes back to a couple of years ago or i should say several years ago really when uh clay thompson and stephen curry had a similar um exchange not as great i will say because you know they were more friendly about it but this one was just it was fun to watch for the time being um jason tatum again having a great shooting night 27 points in the third quarter especially that showdown with jalen brown um but personally i I'm, I don't know if I'm in the majority or the minority. I haven't really seen what the internet's take is on this game, but I, I kind of I was kind of left underwhelmed with this game, and I think certainly the injuries had a big part of it because of a Steph Curry, because of a Kevin Durant, a Zion Williamson. This year's All Star Game was really a showcase of the young talent that has already established themselves, such as a Donovan Mitchell, a Luka Doncic, a John Morant but also gave an opportunity for those that were up and coming and could be the stars of tomorrow, like a De'Aaron Fox, a a Gilgis Alexander, Halliburton, Anthony Edwards, of course, those first-time selections in the All-Star game. But the game itself, I just, I don't know. And and not only that, but Team Giannis had developed a, a big enough lead. So by the time we got to that fourth period where they had to reach the 182 mark in terms of points, it was already kind of a foregone conclusion and team uh, LeBron did make it kind of close towards the end when it was like a six point game and they tried to make a push but then um no it wasn't meant to be um a game winner by Dame Lillard just like a couple of years ago would secure the victory again once again congratulations to team Giannis who had a fun moment there uh, selecting the teams as he was you know picking his reserves he tried to sneak in John Morant and not realizing he was a starter but I can see where the confusion was was because he initially was a reserve member until Stephen Curry got injured and was then bumped up to the starting role. So it was funny. They gave him a lot of grief for it. Um, but, yeah, the final score, 184 to 175, your winners, Team Giannis, in what was, quite frankly, I'm going to say a, a forgettable all-star game. And I don't like being harsh. I try not to be a negative person, a negative Nancy, and and, and really bury you such a fun weekend but um the game itself had left a lot to be desired and i'm hoping that next year there's not as many injuries and not only that but i feel like there was a lot of stars that really didn't make it for one reason or another you know i mean usually we see guys like a chris paul devin booker from the suns Kawhi leonard but a lot of these guys were hurt too and maybe not were playing the best basketball of their careers or of this season not to take away anything from the stars that were selected, because in order to say, oh, this guy was snub, you gotta take one off. And um yeah, I don't think that's I don't think that's right, and I don't think it's justified to make that argument at this moment. I'll take it for what it is. And going into the the post game, we saw an interview with uh head coach of the Denver Nuggets and head coach of Team LeBron, uh, Michael Malone. Whether it was facetious and meant to be lighthearted as a joke or not, you can check out the clip for yourself. Um, He was quoted in saying that this was the worst basketball game ever played. And, of course, when it's the All-Star game, there isn't going to be defense. There isn't going to be a lot of ethics when it comes to the game because it's just a big showcase. It's a big exhibition for the fans. But even in terms of the All-Star game and what the expectations are and what we have seen in the past... I wouldn't go as far as to say it's the worst basketball game I've ever seen, but if I'm going to label it with the all-star game history, I think it's certainly one of those that, you know, we can just move past and, you know, 
let go and just keep moving forward. But looking forward to the second half of the NBA season, certainly with the developments of the Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving trades, seeing how Denver progresses now that there's a little bit more competition in the West, wondering how my Warriors are going to do, given that Stephen Curry is going to be out for a little bit of a time, especially since we were kind of gaining a groove in for the moment. And then, of course, there's surprise teams like the Sacramento Kings in the West. And then with the East, of course, the Bucks, the Celtics, and the steady decline of the Nets. Is it fair for them, you know, to stay the steady decline? No, not necessarily. And although Mikael Bridges was able to drop 45 uh, last week, I don't anticipate that they're going to keep climbing in the standings. I do anticipate they're going to be falling pretty soon. And, um, yeah, no, so keep an eye on that. All-Star weekend, everybody. We'll see you next year in Indianapolis, Indiana. And aside from the All-Star weekend, this week the family and I were able to go see the new Ant-Man film, Quantum Mania. Uh, the 31st entry in the Marvel Cinematic Universe in terms of the films. And I'm not going to lie to you, going into it, I had seen a lot of like reviews. And I don't like talking about the reviews that often because you know it's people's opinions. And I certainly don't like talking about reviews with like friends and family because I don't want to sway their, their expectations going into a movie. And in going into it, there's a lot of mixed reviews about, you know, the storytelling, about the script, about, you know, the pacing of the movie and whatnot. You know, all these, this jargon regarding film. And, but I mean, again, I try to be optimistic about it. And I was just trying to get away, going into it and have a moment to enjoy myself and remove myself from like our reality, if you will, and just immerse yourself into the world that Marvel has been building since 2008. And I got to say, I really enjoyed it. I don't know if I would put it over the first Ant-Man, but I certainly can put it over the second Ant-Man. It was a good time. The best way I can describe it is Marvel's answer to Star Wars, which is which is pretty funny because a lot of people would say that would be Guardians of the Galaxy. But this movie, I felt like there were so many parallels and just the vibe and the characters to that of a Star Wars, specifically um, A New Hope, Episode 4 in 1977. Um a very unique film and and choice of storytelling and it's the I wouldn't say it's the culmination but it's the next step in what they've been trying to tell um in the last couple of years in this phase given that they're now diving more into the multiverse and securing the position of the next big bad as Kang the Conqueror who has been kind of uh, mentioned here and there really since uh, Loki the uh, Disney Plus show Loki, which I'm looking really forward to their second season. And obviously I won't do that many, so, you know, I won't do any spoilers for those who haven't seen it because I know if it was me, I would be very upset if someone spoiled it. But the best thing I can say about this movie is it's, dude, it's not as bad as people are saying it is. I don't even think it's a bad movie, to tell you the truth. Are there some points that I, I guess I can see? Yeah, sure. But I mean, it's not, I don't know. I think I highly recommend for you guys to go ahead and take a look at Ant-Man develop your own opinion and, and, and thoughts on the movie. That's the only way you're going to be able to satisfy your questions and satisfy your theories. You have to watch it for yourself and experience it. You know, grab a couple of friends, get your family going, popcorn, soda, you know the deal. Go ahead and enjoy yourself. And especially given that I think it's the first movie this year um, that really is going to start that whole line of blockbuster movies because it's, it's going to be all year. It used to be limited to just the summer but it, you know, it's really revamped itself into an all-year event. Um, I know the next movie that I'm certainly looking forward to is uh, Scream 6, which is the uh, the franchise that really got me into the horror genre, given that it was very meta and it, it made references to other franchises and, and the humor that's implemented into it. And uh, it's very interesting to see what they're going to do with this installment because it's now taking place in New York. So my brother and I, we make the joke of, you know, Jason takes Manhattan. It's now, you know, Scream takes Manhattan. So uh, we'll see how that goes. I I don't really have any expectations going into it. I'm hoping it's just as good as Scream 5. That was that came out last year, surprisingly. I felt like it was two years ago, but it was last year. So, again, very, very much looking into that and, and curious to see what they do moving forward because I think there was a rumor that, well, hold on, folks. I'm looking. I just got a notification on my phone here, and 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 you're gonna be able to tell when I was recording this. But Russell Wilson 
excuse me, Russell Westbrook plans to sign with the LA Clippers after finalizing a buyout with the Jazz. And again, it's just with Russell Westbrook, he's a talent. And I feel like this is funny because I was just talking about movies. Um, this will be the final segment of the episode, by the way. But Russell Russell Westbrook, I'm not going to say he's not talented. He's certainly an uber-talented athlete who has the capabilities of averaging a triple-double. He's done it for years. He's done it for years, folks. He had a stretch of seasons where I think it was four seasons or four out of five seasons where he just averaged a triple-double. He can do it all. You know, He can score. He can assist. He can rebound. But the one thing he can't do is stay on a team for a decent amount of time. You look at the big contract that the Thunder were able to give him. Each year, he has been with a different team, whether it was with the Wizards, whether it was with the Rockets, whether it was with the Lakers, whether it was with the Jazz for the short time, and now he's going to the Clippers. And the Clippers are a team that I forgot to mention You know when I was ranking those, those Western Conference teams. I do think they have a little bit more depth than the LA Lakers personally but that's only assuming health you know because of the Kawhi Leonard Kawhi Leonard was on a trajectory to be one of the all-time great NBA stars because he had won that championship for Toronto and people were talking about comparing him with Michael Jordan which I think was unwarranted and, and, and quite frankly premature but since that championship what has Kawhi Leonard done other than load manage and get hurt and I don't like doing that you know having to again bury a talent like that but it's the truth aside from that championship after 2019 I can't think of one solid thing he's actually done so the acquisition of Russell Westbrook again adds a level of depth to their guards but even then it has been proven wherever he goes that team they struggle I don't wish the Clippers to struggle, but I just I just don't see how it's going to work in the long run. And I, again, I don't want to be a pessimistic about it, but that's certainly another interesting asset and another interesting facet of the game for the Western Conference, certainly. And especially given the whole John Morant interview that had taken place, you know, not too long ago, where they asked him about his thoughts on the West and who were the biggest competition to the Grizzlies. And he replied, the Celtics. Because he didn't think there was a competition in the West. And he and he also doubled down on it in the All-Star game where Draymond interviews him about, you know, what are your thoughts on the West? And even after the whole Kyrie trade and, and the Lakers kind of retooling and the Phoenix Suns getting the talents of Kevin Durant. And obviously the Westbrook trade or the Westbrook signing hadn't happened then, but now it has, he still doubles down on the Celtics because he thinks the Grizzlies are just that much better. When a team like the Warriors, who are struggling to you know keep their head above water and stay above 500, consistently beats them, and this rivalry that is supposed to be manifesting but really isn't because they can't beat the Warriors, and I had this conversation with 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 a friend of mine from work. Um, I love John Morant's game. I think he's talented. I think he's entertaining. But he talks a big game for a guy that really hasn't done anything. He's made an all-star game. He's made the playoffs. I'm pretty sure he was an all-NBA last year. But what has he done in the playoffs? Did he make the Western Conference Finals? No. Has he won a championship? No. MVP? No. First team all-NBA? No. So I love the confidence. But there's this fine line of confidence versus cockiness you got to be able to back it up, man. And, again, it's, he's very much young in his career. There's a lot of time for him to accomplish whatever he will accomplish, whether it's championships, MVPs, brand deals, you know, what, whatever. There's still so much more time. But, dude, you can't be talking like this, talking all crazy, when you really haven't done anything. And I wish him the best. I really do. I like John Moran. I like the game. But the West is certainly heating up. And is it a direct correlation to those comments he made? Hey, who knows? But I'll tell you what, as an NBA fan, I'm certainly looking forward to the second half and seeing where the league goes from here and how the playoff picture will shape up heading into the play-in, heading into the tournament, and, and crowning the new NBA champion. 
because quite frankly, as a Golden State fan, I don't think we're going back to back. I'll be the first one to say that before any of my friends give me grief. I don't think we're going back to back. But hey, who knows? That's why you play the game. And as we bring this episode to a close, I wanted to give major thanks to all you guys listening and continue to support the podcast as you can find me on all social media platforms at just Jose underscore three. Be sure to follow the podcast on Spotify or subscribe to the YouTube channel, J Area Podcast, where you can find each of these episodes of the show and also small, small clips on the YouTube Shorts page, which have been doing wonderful numbers. And once again, I want to thank you guys for the support and continuing to allow this to grow. Uh, thank you for dropping by and hanging out with us. And if you enjoy these episodes, please be sure to leave a like, comment your thoughts on the All-Star Weekend, or if you've seen Ant-Man already, what you thought about the movie. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, J Area Podcast. And ladies and gentlemen, my name has been Jose. This is the J Area Podcast, and we will certainly see you again next week. Thank you.